Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Very excited to be here this evening uh, to talk about the legal challenges of uh, regulating a robot. Uh, and I want to start by talking about what it might, what it is that might be different about robots as compared to other machines or other other products uh, that we already regulate with the law. Uh, and I'm going to lay out three uh, major differences here. Uh, the first being the social valence of a robot as compared to other machines, uh, and then uh, moving on to how they're substituting for other people and other things, uh, and to the emergent qualities of the things that robots do. Uh, so in talking about social valence, valence, I want to open with this clip. You may have seen it on YouTube. Unusual for children and adults to anthropomorphize things. Uh, but in this case, a broken water heater that sort of looks like a robot. Uh, but this is very different than products we think of in terms of your refrigerator, your microwave, even your car. Uh, people have proven to be much more likely to uh, give you feelings, uh, intent, uh, independent agency. Uh, to robots than they are to other things, and this can have consequences for who we're going to blame when something goes wrong, uh, and for whether we might uh, trust something or feel betrayed by it if it does something we don't expect. Uh, the other feature that I want to lay out uh, is substitution. Uh, here we have the Pero seal. Uh, it's uh, uh, an animatronic seal. You may have seen it in an episode of Master of None uh, that's being used in uh, nursing homes, especially with dementia patients, uh, because it, it coos, it purrs, you can feed it, you can nurture it, and this is, has a very therapeutic effect. Uh, and it doesn't require the same uh, investment of time or money as it would to have actual people there uh, or to do animal therapy with pets. Uh, but it is a substitute for these other kinds of care that someone might get. And as we get into uh, areas like uh, surgery, where we have uh, a robotic surgeon coming in, or into factories where we automate the work, uh, you're substituting machines that are imperfect substitutes for the people that used to be there. Uh, they don't have the same common sense or moral intuitions or financial constraints that we might rely on as we think about the rules that should apply to the human actors that used to be in those spaces. So sometimes we're going to need to update the rules to take account of that. Uh, and the last factor I want to lay out today uh, is the idea of emergence. Uh, that one of the things that's interesting and exciting about uh, robotics and AI systems uh, is that they could solve complicated problems, uh, that they wouldn't necessarily be confined to just a set uh, of uh, relatively simple commands. But as they get out into the world, as they encounter unanticipated issues, uh, they're going to come up with responses that their creators uh, couldn't have predicted. Uh, sometimes this is great and adaptive. Uh, sometimes this can lead to accidents that you would imagine a human being uh, not getting into. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, a textbook about uh, the genetics of flies that is here selling for over $2 million on Amazon. How did this come to be? Uh, we actually have two different sellers offering the book, and both of them are employing an algorithm to price the book. Uh, the one with the higher price, Bordy Book, uh, has an algorithm where they price it at 22% uh, above the lowest selling other copy. They figure that they'll get by on their, their higher ratings, their higher total sales, they have 125,000 versus the 8,000 of the competitor, uh, and that they can still, they can, uh, cash in on that goodwill. 
uh, whereas ProfNath here has an algorithm saying they're going to price at uh, about 97% of the highest price. And so you end up with an arms race where Board eBook jumps up 20% over the existing price, uh, ProfNath catches up to 97% of that, then we leapfrog another 20%, 97%, 20%, 97%. Uh, and we end up with this absurd result. And the funny thing about this is these were two very simple algorithms uh, in a context where you pretty much understand what's going on. You're just trying to set a price for a book on Amazon. Uh, so if we end up with something that's <coughs> a, as comical of a mistake as this with a simple algorithm, uh, we can anticipate that there, much, there might be uh, other mistakes out there with more complicated systems interacting with the real world uh, or interacting with other AI systems in the real world. Uh, so now let's apply these principles to think about three of the most pressing uh, concerns that we have with robots and the law. Uh, we're going to talk about whether robots should have rights, uh, who's liable when a robot makes a mistake, uh, and the new privacy and cybersecurity issues that arise as we bring robots uh, into our homes, especially. So should we, do we owe rights to robots? Uh, on one level, you think the kinds of autonomous systems that we're talking about now, uh, they don't have feelings, they don't have the capacity to feel pain. Uh, if we were further in the future, if we had uh, robots that did have fully developed consciousnesses, like uh, the Terminator or uh, the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica, or any of these fixtures of science fiction, you think, well, they are practically indistinguishable from people. Why would we deprive them of rights? But that's not what we're talking about, at least yet. Uh, but we're still having this discussion, in part because the things that we see uh, are uh, eliciting these empathetic responses from us. Uh, this is the Pleo. It's another one of these animatronic uh, creatures, and it's, it's widely sold as a toy. Uh, there are as a de very dedicated following to these creatures. Uh, but my friend Kate Darling conducted an experiment with them. Uh, she uh, gathered a number of people, had them interact with the Pleos, uh, feed them, walk them around, uh, do the, the nice things you're supposed to do, uh, and then handed them clubs and knives and said, uh, will you now uh, torment this creature? Most of them said, no, we're not going to do it. They had developed an attachment already uh, to this you know, walking teddy bear. Uh, and it's not just people in a lab setting. Uh, they were testing a mind-sweeping drone. Uh, it was uh, designed like a stick insect or like an ungainly spider. It had a number of different legs. Uh, one of the most effective ways to diffuse a mind is to just trigger it. So it would walk around the minefield, uh, step on a mine. One of the legs would blow off. Uh, once it got down to the final leg, it was dragging itself along the field, and the colonel in charge of the experiment called it off, saying it was inhumane. Uh, so again, this is not something, this is a very widespread sort of response. Uh, and on one level, we might say, okay, we're letting our, our feelings of sort of cute, cuddly things get in the way, but there is still an argument out there from why we might care about these things. Uh, even if they're not feeling pain, to the extent that we think uh, engaging in this sort of behavior is the kind of thing that might lead to uh, future violence or lead people to have a certain moral callousness. Uh, this is one of the justifications for uh, animal cruelty laws, apart from uh, sparing the animals the suffering, the suffering, but also uh, sort of stopping behaviors that often lead to uh, domestic abuse or other problems. Uh, so, so that's one idea to put out there. In, term of, in terms of robot rights. Moving on to the question of who's liable when a robot causes injury, we have over 100 years of product liability law, uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution, where we had to trace, OK, we had this manufacturer and that manufacturer of different parts. They were put together here. They were sold in the stream of commerce. And we figured out, more or less, who was going to be liable in that system. We have new problems here, uh, in part because of the emergence, the emergent characteristics of robot behavior. Uh, if you've got somebody building the hardware, uh, somebody doing the first round of the software, someone else uh, tweaking it later on, reinstalling something, modifying it, uh, and then someone employing it in an 
unexpected setting, which one of those along the way uh, is going to be liable uh, when they all seem to have had some hand in the ultimate uh, outcome. So for example, we have this car crash of an autonomous vehicle. Uh, it was in Tempe, Arizona. It, it was one of Uber's tests. And it seemed to be going fine until uh, a human driver didn't correctly yield. Uh, and so we have this collision. Uh, it, this one, thankfully, not fatal. We have another example where Tesla was testing its autopilot, uh, and things were going fine until it encountered a big white <coughs> transfer truck. Uh, it saw the big white field and thought, this is just the sky, drove straight into the truck. Uh, and as we're getting into these situations, some of these early uh, examples are relatively easy because we have just Uber or Tesla designing the car, designing the software, operating these things. So we haven't faced the tough questions yet of what happens when we have home users uh, instructing these things on what to do. The other issue to think about with robot liability uh, is the potential uh, for scapegoating here. Uh, there's a colorful story of this robot that kept escaping from a laboratory in Russia. Uh, it caused trouble several times when it would uh, wander out into street intersections and have to, have to be brought home. And on this particular occasion, it was deployed purposefully uh, for this uh, political rally. It was going to record people's responses for one side or the other. Uh, but the police were called to remove the robot. They did indeed handcuff it and remove it from the premises. And this is, this is a fun little story. Uh, nothing terrible happened to the robot or the people involved. But there's this broader impulse here uh, to see the robot as this free and autonomous agent, and if it does something wrong, to put the blame on it or to punish it. Uh, and maybe sometimes that's the right response, but usually you want to think who deployed this thing, who designed this thing, who might have messed up along the way, uh, and are they trying to shield themselves from liability, not through the usual channels like a limited liability corporation, but by putting a robot out in their place. It would be a strange sort of legal regime that would allow them to do that sort of thing. And finally, I want to talk a bit about privacy. Uh, this is uh, a hot topic these days. There's the exhibit outside, which I encourage you all to see. Uh, and one of the upshots of the kind of corporate monitoring that we get uh, already, just from our online behavior, uh, is that marketers like Amazon are building detailed profiles uh, of what it is that we're interested in and marketing to us on that basis. Okay, uh, some people have issues with that. Some people see it as an okay trade for the kinds of free services that we get from not only Amazon, but Google and Facebook and, and various providers online. But there's an added wrinkle once we have the robots in our home. Uh, on the one hand, uh, to the extent that they're listening uh, all the time, the way that something like uh, uh, Amazon's Alexa is, they might be gathering a much more detailed profile than anything they had before. And additionally, we, we should think about the potentials for manipulation. Uh, if Alexa suggests to you, hey, why don't you buy this uh, new gadget? Uh, maybe you are uh, in a position to reject sort of uh, sales pitches that you're not interested in. Uh, but what if we're talking about an elderly person with a device like the Paro that we saw earlier, some sort of caregiving device, that then comes in and says, oh, you know, I, I've taken such good care of you. Uh, why don't you upgrade me to the latest operating system? It'll only be $500. I can take even better care of you. Or, or make other sort of exploitative requests uh, to people who are uh, potentially in a state where they could be manipulated. Uh, we also might think about children. If you have a, a robotic Barbie that says, I'm so sad when you leave, to school, leave for school. I really want a friend. Why don't you get robotic skipper so that I have someone to play with while you're away? Again, this is a sort of marketing that strikes many people as troubling. Uh, and as we think about what sort of consumer protection laws might be, need to be in place, these are the sorts of behaviors that we should at least be looking out for. The other concern with privacy here, as we have devices that are in our homes and always listening, uh, is 
It's one thing if you have invited the Alexa into your home and Amazon is getting this information. Uh, it's another thing if that then opens you up uh, to government requests for those records of what's being said. Uh, or if we have hackers, whether we're talking uh, the North Korea story, the Russia story, various China stories, uh, to the extent that we're worried about uh, parties other than Amazon coming in and, and getting detailed records about uh, what we're saying or doing in our homes, uh, robots are part of the growing Internet of Things. Uh, these devices that have sensors and internet connectivity uh, that should uh, cause us some concern as to how our privacy is going to be protected. Uh, two weeks ago, there was finally some resolution in a case that was brought in Arkansas. Uh, there was a murder case uh, where uh, the suspect in his home had an Amazon Alexa. And the police came to him saying, okay, or actually they came to Amazon saying, okay, we want the records of whatever Alexa reported. Uh, we want to hear whether there were signs of a struggle, whether there, were, uh, whether there was yelling, whether there was fighting, whether there was anything that might uh, show that this guy did it, or perhaps uh, you know, show that he didn't. Uh, and because of something called the third party doctrine <coughs> under the Fourth Amendment, uh, the standards for the government requesting records collected by a commercial party like Amazon are relatively low. Uh, and we might want to revisit uh, legal doctrines like that if the kinds of records that Amazon has uh, are now so all-encompassing. Uh, the resolution for that case, as I said two weeks ago, uh, was that the defendant finally said, OK, fine, we'll hand over the records. Uh, apparently, he believed that this would be good evidence for him, so we didn't have to get to this Fourth Amendment question uh, to, to Amazon's challenge to the request. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that will depend on how we interpret the Constitution going forward and what sort of laws we pass as to law enforcement's access uh, to consumer records. So I've teed up those problems to think about. Uh, and as we move into the film, uh, Ex Machina, uh, I want you to keep in mind the, the three features that I mentioned earlier as we, as we see what Ava and the other robots are doing and analyze what are the benefits and what are the problems uh, that are raised by uh, the social valence of them and their behavior, the way that we regard them as uh, being human beings, uh, by the substitution of these devices for people who might be doing the things that they're doing, uh, and as we think about the sort of emergent behaviors that arise as they interact with each other, with the environment, with other people, uh, and encounter stimuli and problems. Uh, that they weren't programmed directly to deal with. So uh, without uh, further lecture, I look forward to discussing these uh, questions and issues after the film. Don't make your robots attractive and don't work in isolation. That's the lesson here. So I, I did actually find his isolation to be one of the more uh, fictitious elements here. You know, so besides the, the huge leaps of technology that would be required, the idea that he could do all of this by himself, uh, with, I, I, especially those of you in the audience who are engineers can probably appreciate how uh, people work in teams. <laughs> so. But one other, actually, on a serious note, on a serious note, there's no way to know whether or not any of us are conscious, except for say myself. So that um, any projection on my part onto an other that appears conscious, uh, I mean, I would act towards that other as though they are conscious, say an animal or a human being, um, is probably the best way to go. And if I met an artificial being that human beings made that also appeared to me as conscious, the best course of action I think would be to take, uh, would be to treat them morally. But I know that I don't know whether any of us are conscious, except for myself, um, and animals and human beings and robots and all. What would you say to that? So I, I would agree with, with the the Descartes insight there of not having any awareness, uh, you know, 
of other people's consciousness or even the extent uh, to which anything exists outside of our own consciousness. Uh, so that's that's a centuries old problem that I, I certainly don't have a solution here to. Uh, your second point about treating things morally, I mean, that is something that did play out in the film here. Uh, to the extent that the behavior we saw towards whatever sorts of uh, machines or, or thinking entities we had here was uh, of the manipulative or uh, cruel kind that we saw from Nathan. Uh, it seemed perhaps to have been internalized or reacted to in such a way that uh, led to those events. Now, whether that's how actual thinking machines would act, I don't know, but it, it does seem uh, like a decent rule of thumb to start with. Since, since you're a lawyer, um, one of the problems I see is that society and the law are reactive. They're waiting for things, and then they're going to say, well, now we'll create a law after it's all, the genie's already out of the bottle. Uh, just to tell a real quick story, there are autonomous drones, drones that are self-functioning, that are not controlled by human beings. And I was part of a discussion with the FAA, and they were not aware of that. And there are no rules or regulations about self-functioning autonomous drones. I guess they're waiting for a disaster, and then they'll have a uh, congressional hearing. <laughs> so that, that is unfortunately often how we see things, especially things that uh, become uh, major major discussions are actually make it into law. Uh, one of the questions that's become increasingly important uh, with the advance of uh, robotic, robotics, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, a, a range of things that are moving very quickly, uh, is this question of to what extent can we draft uh, technology neutral laws, and to what extent do we need technology specific laws that cover particularly robotics, AI, autonomous drones, non-autonomous drones, whatever the different silos might be. Uh, and the law as it's set up right now uh, has at least some technology neutral backstops. Uh, so to the extent that you are invading recognized rights of privacy, or to the extent that you are imposing physical harm on somebody else, uh, these, are, these are things that are going to be unlawful, uh, sometimes criminal, uh, at least tortious, so that the FCC could come after you or someone could sue you. Uh, for the things that you've done, but then the question is, what if the technology makes something possible that we just hadn't contemplated before, we couldn't have even drafted the neutral law for it, uh, and that's where we need to have uh, sufficient agility in whoever's making and enforcing the law in these areas. Uh, if Congress is moving too slowly, uh, that's a reason to think about uh, the FTC, the FCC, uh, possible new agencies, uh, or uh, agencies and uh, legislatures at the state level uh, who might be able to respond more uh, quickly. Uh, and, and, and one quick thought there uh, is uh, California has often been at the forefront of privacy legislation uh, in terms of uh, when, when they passed the California Online Privacy Act, uh, it was uh, the first act of its kind. Uh, all it required was that websites state and uh, privacy policies clearly and then comply with them. No other state had this rule, uh, but in order to avoid the hassle of having to come up with different websites state by state, they went, they rose to the highest denominator, essentially. They, they complied with California law on this, uh, and so now here in Connecticut, uh, or wherever you might be, you enjoy those protections. Uh, so sometimes states are moving on these issues. Sometimes they're moving on interesting directions. They propose laws that would allow you to shoot down drones, that are on your property, but uh, so it goes. Getting to the point about the Cartesian consciousness, uh, I think one of the key points here is you named this company Blue Book, which what did Wittgenstein do in Blue Book attacked the idea of Cartesian consciousness. He says it makes no sense to doubt the existence of another consciousness, which, and also I, I think it's interesting that uh, he, I, as I understood the Turing test, it's about intelligence, not consciousness. Is that correct? So I, I've seen different incarnations. I mean, uh, Turing's paper I'm talking about. 
Oh, so I'm, I'm not as familiar with Troik's original paper. So that, that may be true, uh, because we, we see versions that are focused on intelligence, versions that are focused on can you pass in whatever context as uh, human, not co-detected as an AI. Uh, and, and here they were using it, of course, very loosely. Uh, and and uh, it would seem that Nathan was playing mind games for much of the film. So what he actually intended to, for anyone to be testing uh, it, it is, is unclear, because Ultimately, I don't think that was his motive here. Anyone else? Uh, what we saw in the movie was a gel brain. But we're actually moving uh, very quickly now that as our bodies are degrading, more and more people are choosing re replacement parts that are not living. Now, what happens if we reach the point where it's 51% machine and 49% us, but on the brain level, you know, not the heart valves or anything, but as computers get better, they're doing experiments left and right, merging computational power to help people that either have lost their limbs or uh, this could be healthy people that need would like a brain boost. Where would the law go in this direction? Is the person more machine or more human? So, so as we're talking about that sort of cyborging, uh, you know, at, at this point, uh, because they're so as far as the law would, would be concerned in those cases, it would say, look, you're still a person. You've been augmented in various ways, but the law is going to apply to you as it applies to other people. Uh, unless, for some reason, we, we got into a situation where uh, there were special regulations for cyborgs, or we got to some scenario like this, where we have entities that seem human but aren't, and we need special laws for that. So, but, but setting that aside, I, I think uh, for the most part, the law would, would be comfortable continuing to treat you as a human being. But then we have the questions of, well, what do we do with the, these sorts of enhancement technologies? Uh, are these the sorts of things that we're comfortable just allowing people if, if they want to have superhuman stamina uh, or to be stronger, or as you mentioned, the brain boost? Uh, are, is that the sort of thing that we're going to allow? Uh, is this something that we only want to allow in cases where it's medically necessary? Uh, what sort of lines uh, are, are going to be drawn there, uh, which is primarily in the domain of uh, medical ethics, uh, but is the sort of thing that would probably end up inscribed into a law depending on how those discussions went. <coughs> but the, the question of what is a human being, at, at Bill's point, at some point, somebody's going to say, no, you have to have eight fingers. If you have seven fingers, you're not a human being. And we make those decisions now. We've made them in the past. When they didn't allow women to vote, it's because, very frankly, they thought women weren't full human beings. When they had slavery of blacks, it's because they thought blacks were not full human beings. And so when you have a brain sitting in a machine, is that a human being? What if you have? Uh, a, a human body and it's an external brain. Is that a human being? So at some point they're going to start making these decisions. We're already making them now. You know, when does human life occur? We can get into a whole debate about abortion. And people draw the line at different, different places, but we do make that decision. Mm -hmm. so, so this is one of those places where I think you encounter a legal disruption to the extent that you're presenting the kind of question that hasn't been presented before. Uh, and up to a certain point, uh, courts will be comfortable saying, look, we don't see anything different about this person who is 90% human, 80% human, 70% human, or, or so forth, whatever sort of scenario we're having with cyborgs. Uh, if they do reach an extreme point where we, it seems like there's something fundamentally different, whatever we might that define that to be. Uh, your brain in the bat example calls to mind the issue of what well, we, we normally think of humans as being able to interact 
in the world around them. We, we do uh, have provisions for people who are in a uh, comatose state. We have all sorts of provisions that are designed uh, to help integrate people with disabilities into society. So, so there's still some uh, regard for people despite inabilities in, in those ways, but, but as it's perhaps taken on intentionally or in these new ways, there will be new questions. Uh, and when we get to that point that courts aren't comfortable coming up with new answers, we'll reach the, the phase where uh, we're looking at new laws uh, in order to figure out what to do uh, with people in these different categories. Uh, and and I, I'm certainly not going to put it past uh, any society, uh, you know, which, whatever country, whatever time we might be looking at, to, to draw lines in ways that uh, might promote the interests of some people over those of others. Uh, and, and so if we reach that sort of scenario where we had you know, people with cybernetics being an upper or a lower caste in that sort of system, we could see that playing out as a political matter. Uh, but but I, but this is the sort of thing that uh, I, I would see coming further down the line, and, and once the court sort of ran out of satisfactory analogies and piecemeal decisions. So it seemed to me that um, excuse me. hold on oh I'm sorry <laughs> it seemed to me that one of the reasons he was chosen for this test was his moral compass. He's a good, quote unquote, good man. And this final iteration of artificial intelligence, um, this test, well, that's the one thing that Ava didn't have. She, um, everything that she did was at, you know, with no moral compass whatsoever. And that last scene of her um, people watching, you know what she's doing. She's just, building up her arsenal. <laughs> and uh, I think she's going to be fairly successful, by the way. <laughs> so, so as a matter of this story, that is one of the more intriguing loose ends to me, is sort of what her end game might be. Uh, because if she was simply programmed at some level, like escape, you know, and, you know, and, and ex maybe it was even programmed, pre-programmed into her, like escape and go to some city intersection, uh, does she have the capacity to come up with further goals for herself and use all of these tools? I or is, is that the end of the line? I, I, I think she's, she's, she's launched. I really do. Cool. And, and then the other issue this keys into is the manipulation point that we got into a bit uh, before the screening. Uh, so this is, this is a very sophisticated uh, AI. Uh, it, as the gentleman in the back pointed out, uh, it, it didn't hurt that she had and could use her sexuality in a strategic sort of way. Uh, and with hypersensory tools like being able to read micro expressions, uh, I, is facial recognition technology there? No, not yet. Uh, but is that the sort of thing that you could see any number of corporations or governments being interested in funding? Well, yes. Uh, and, and so with all those sorts of tools, uh, figuring out what what sort of duties do things that we bring into our homes owe us? Uh, my advisor at Yale uh, has a, a nice phrase in talking about product liability, that the, the product liability problem of the 20th century was, my toaster exploded, someone's injured, who's liable? The product liability problem of the 21st century is going to be, my toaster is spying on me. Who is it reporting to, and what can they do with that information? <laughs> I just wanted to comment from a cultural perspective, the misogyny in the film and the sexism. I assume that the writer or the director were commenting on the bro culture and the sexism in the, you know, whole area. If you know anything about that. And so I, I don't know if there's specific intention. Uh, I always read the, the Nathan character that way as being intentionally unlikable in it, in his outlook, especially uh, with regards to uh, women or, or female bodies as he created them. Uh, and, and and I imagine that it was intentional on their part to, to say, OK, we, un we appreciate these dynamics from both science fiction and from some things that we've observed 
uh, in the world. Uh, we're going to include them in the movie, but we're going to clearly link them to this character who's doing it from a particular place of his, his personal misogyny or whatever sort of culture we would uh, lump them into, uh, as opposed to doing it in a, a sort of, as opposed to leaving that open as to who created it that way and why. At least we get some glimpse into uh, the kinds of people who might be making decisions. Uh, and, and to the extent that you're concerned with uh, Silicon Valley culture or, or whatever other cultures are uh, behind various platforms and various devices, it, it makes sense to look into, okay, well, uh, what is their outlook? Uh, what, what are their operating principles? Uh, and to what extent, where, where it gets to the point of things that we want to legally regulate, uh, can we trust them to self-regulate and when do we need to have uh, some other process in place in order to look into uh, privacy concerns, safety concerns, cybersecurity, and so on. Like Uber, I mean, that's exactly what happened. And uh, do, do you have a, 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 particular, a, a particular issue about Uber? Uh, well, Uber's been in the news lately, you know, for the head of this thing. And then the whole privacy issue, because they've been telling their drivers that they're buying them in all kinds of issues, how they use the data, et cetera. And there are a range of issues there, and, and one of the things that's interesting as well uh, is how much Uber has tried to argue the law doesn't apply to them. Uh, and, and they're in an interesting place because to come in and say, look, taxi regulation is broken in some form or another. Well, that may be true uh, in terms of the reasons that we don't see better taxi services or better prices uh, or taxis at the times and in the places that we want to see them. Uh, I know a lot of people have welcomed being able to use an app like what Uber offers and the pressure that Uber has created has forced more taxi companies to offer things like that. So to the extent that it's putting pressure on a system that wasn't working, great. But to the extent that they've been also trying to leverage things about their supposed uniqueness to get around uh, employment laws uh, or to skirt uh, insuring against uh, various kinds of liability uh, or to uh, find new ways to control employees by these these sorts of uh, monitoring and manipulation tactics that you're referring to. There was a good piece in the New York Times a few weeks back and in some follow-up coverage about some of that. Uh, and ordinarily, the way an employer employee relationship works is that you're an employee if the employer has the ability to control what it is that you're doing. Ordinarily, the way that happens is they say, hey, go do this. Uh, and they tell you in some sufficient level of detail how to do it. Here, they weren't doing that exactly. Uh, but they were uh, structuring the way that the app worked in such a way uh, to put various pressures, to, to create incentives for employees to behave in a very specific way, or else get cut off, or else get uh, rides that would be ranked more poorly. Uh, and, and so here we have a new question, the kind of thing that could go to a court to say, okay, the question is still the same one that we've had for quite some time in employment law. Is sufficient control being exercised? Now it's being done in a new way. Does that still count? Uh, and, and, and that's the kind of question that uh, I, I think we'll soon be grappled with. One of the other questions that comes up with that is who owns us and our data? So as we look at what we've been, uh, older generations are afraid of the government the government spying on us and the government knowing what we're doing, younger generations are freely selling everything that they have and who they are for nothing. So we are allowed, we have these apps that are allowed to know where we are. They're trying to sell us things all day or sell us to other people, which is all fine and good because it's free. But we're worried about the government who's supposedly monitoring us to keep us safe. How, how do you put those two together? So it's, it's a bit tricky. I, I, I like the tongue-in-cheek way that the one uh, image I put up earlier uh, of the Alexa saying, okay, it used to be uh, that in the 60s, in the 70s, we were worried, oh, the government's going to wiretap us. Uh, but now we're at the point of being comfortable having these kinds of devices. And, and the joke is, Hey, wiretap can cats eat pancakes? You know the sort of silly things that we ask on Google or, or Amazon uh, in within this network. Uh, and people have very different 
takes on, on sort of the, the changing nature of the problem. Uh, I, I had done some research a while back in the context of libraries, which have always been at the forefront of resisting government surveillance. Uh, when the FBI sends, sent agents in the 70s and 80s into libraries, uh, both public and academic, uh, librarians rang the alarm. They were at the front of the battle to put an end to those sorts of programs. They reared up in the same way uh, over you know, the past you know, nearly two decades in response to the Patriot Act. Uh, but I found that as libraries made arrangements with companies like uh, Overdrive, which allows for the checking out of ebooks to uh, various devices, including the Kindle, uh, they were now creating uh, a circumstance where you could go to the library site, use your library card, suspect perhaps that you're covered by the traditional sorts of privacy protections you expect at the library, but in fact reveal all of what you're doing to Amazon. And some librarians care about this, but a number were still rooted in the concern of, well, we're really resisting government surveillance. These are voluntary sorts of transactions between the patron and Amazon. Uh, and, and these are questions we have to work through uh, as a society to figure out, okay, well, what, what are we comfortable with? When, when are we going to pay for things with privacy, which is essentially, the, you, or with our information, rather, uh, when you're using a service like Google Search, uh, or Facebook, uh, or any number of other platforms that don't cost any money, uh, well, in some sense, the product is you, uh, as you've suggested. Uh, and figuring out when it's appropriate to give data, what rules, what laws need to apply to uh, the process for obtaining our consent, uh, or what can be done with it afterwards, uh, are very important questions. Uh, and, and I'd love to chat about that at length. But, but it's, it's a, a whole other can of worms. Okay. Thank you, everyone.